All right, let's head on down and get our inshore report of the week. Super excited to talk to Captain Richard Rutland with Cold Blooded Fishing. Welcome back to the show, Cat. How are we doing today? Man, I'm doing it. I'm doing great, man. Um, we've uh, <laughs> it's been uh, really cold the past couple of days, and yes. uh, I've had I've had kids at the house when they should be at school, so I've been um, trying to wrangle with some kids and get some rods built. This is always like great weather for getting some rod, you know, getting your yeah. tack tackle in sword or um you know i saw patrick garmerson's been uh sending out uh trip emails and stuff like that that's what guys gotcha do up. whatever that's right yeah you get this bad <laughs> cold weather you find things to do inside you know so like i said i'm jamming out fishing rods got a couple customers i'm getting some rods done for and i'm ma mainly building stuff for myself you know um very cool so, you building anything cool right now uh yeah i got a new um i got a new seven foot uh six uh, blank that I've never built before. It's a medium fast blank, and uh, I'm building it to to slick lure fish on a casting casting rod. And uh, I'm gonna do floor. It's gonna be fluorocarbon only. I probably won't put braid on it. It'll be a fluorocarbon only rod. And so uh, I've got the exact same blank already in a seven three. I'm real curious to see what the seven six is gonna do. I'm really excited about it. it already feels really really good. I can't wait to get some. Uh, some finish on it this uh as soon as i get off here with y'all i'm gonna put some finish on it Very and nice. uh yep yeah, i'm gonna i'm gonna be tempted to take it with me tomorrow but i'm not i'm gonna leave it in here and let it dry for at least two days uh especially with it being chilly um all that you know all, all your resin and, and everything it needs it needs extra time to, to get up to where it's properly like truly yeah and truly tack free you know what i mean like the the last thing you want to do is go put like a finger job on your <laughs> on your rod that you've been working on for however four or five six hours of worth the time. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Well, man, that's a that's a great point right there. Before we jump into the report, um, kind of what you say you're building a slick rod just for slicking. What do you what do you call the optimal slick rod? Like, what are you looking for as far as you know backbone action? So, uh, so my favorite, my favorite blanks, or I guess we'll say links and action and power, uh, if I'm using braided line is about a, a seven, a seven foot to a seven, six at the very top, really more like a, for uh, really more like a seven to a seven, three, a seven, three is, is, is almost about the perfect length. I do have one particular blank that I like in the seven, six, um, once you start to get over a about seven three man that really wears out your arm uh you know and even me who who i, I would say i'm in great fishing condition you know what i mean as much as yeah, i fish a lot of reps uh it, yeah it'll it'll really wear it'll the rod will just wear you out all day once you start to get above that seven three so i think a seven three is about perfect and i like a medium to medium light power uh eight to 15 pound uh class rod and uh i like an extra fast tip on there and what that extra fast tip is what i real what makes the the slick lure really shine uh when you when you use it in a braided braided line uh application because it's a nice spongy whippy tip and about the only the last third of the rod is what bends right you got a lot of backbone from like three quarters of the rod down to the butt um and and so that sponginess man is what really gets to me gets that joker to dart around a whole lot you know the yeah. water that 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 lure really i mean it, i feel like it, it darts back and forth like left and right like 18 inches yeah, it's you know bunch. back and forth and it's going up and down and it's it's just all over the place and so um so that's that's my optimal i guess length and action and power for that um on the fluorocarbon side i like something a little bit stiffer i like more like a fast action maybe more like a um uh, a 10 to 15 pound rod or 10 to 8 to 8 to 17 pounds somewhere there every rod blank or manufacturer kind of makes uh you know a bunch of different line classes but a little bit heavier uh and a little bit stiffer tip i don't like that extra fast tip i'm still you know wanting just really the last third of the rod to bend um but I'm not putting uh, with fluorocarbon. I can't put a bunch of crazy action on the rod. Like when I'm when I'm doing my retrieve, it's very subtle. Um, I kind of I've learned a, I've learned the the fluorocarbon thing from Captain Bobby. Mm -hmm. uh, he's always been a fluorocarbon guy, and 
you know, he and I are always pretty, you know, we tournament fish together and we're always pretty much tick for tat um, as far as like getting bites and, uh, and, and connecting the fish, like setting the hook and getting a fork, what we call getting a fork in them. Uh, sometimes that fluorocarbon edges the braid out a little bit and sometimes it's the other way, just a little bit, you know. So I, like I said, I made myself learn it. And uh, heck, I, I'm starting to like the fluorocarbon more and more. I still fish the braid just as much as the fluorocarbon, but uh, but so anyway, like I said, just a, I like a, a little stiffer, maybe a medium, medium heavy uh, blank for that. Um, and the reason is is because with the fluorocarbon rod, I really have to. I feel like I'm, it's got stretch in it, right? Braid sure. has zero stretch, whatever, whatsoever. So fluorocarbon. Although it doesn't have near the stretch that that monofilament does, I don't think I, I don't think you could hook a fish with that stuff with monofilament, um, on the slick lure. But that so the but the fluorocarbon still to me feels like a rubber band, and I have to keep the rod way, way out in front of me, um, versus being able to to cheat a little bit like when you have braided line, if that makes any sense. That's a lot I just threw out there. Oh, okay, <laughs> that's the exact question I was going to ask, and I was like. Why the seven? Why do you think the seven six with the fluorocarbon? I'm assuming because it's got a little bit more backbone than yeah, those yeah. So yeah, so the one I'm working on, yeah, that seven six. So the, there's two things. The longer, uh, two things about that. So the longer the rod is, number one, you can cast it farther, right? You would For be sure. amazed, Angelo, at what three inches, three inches on a rod does. You know what I mean? I've got uh i've got a in the same blank i've got a seven three and i've got a seven six that i fish braid and i can throw the seven six and i'm talking about three inches i can throw it 20 feet farther with three more <laughs> inches of rod uh same line same reel same everything same lure you know unbelievable yeah. it blows my mind i'm it. gonna get i'm gonna be able to cover more water so i'm gonna be able to throw it farther and then two I feel like you get a better hook set, man, because you got more stick out there in front of them. And you, you go to set the hook and you come around, you're getting tighter, quicker on the fish, if that makes any sense, because you're using, because you got a little bit longer rod. Um, and I, I feel like your hookup ratio will get a little bit better. Um, if that it seems like a win across the board to me. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, like, because braid, when you get to twitching it, sometimes it gets around your rod tip. Yeah. Sure. You know? And you get wind knots in it. And so if you can get 20 foot further with three inches longer rod, I mean, as long as you don't get carpal tunnel syndrome in your shoulder. Uh, <laughs> I mean, sometimes that 20 foot makes a difference. I've just been fishing oh, yeah. with you. Especially when you add it up. No doubt. 50 feet further than I do. Yeah. Uh, so. I, you know, and to that point, and I've probably, I've said this already on this, on the show a hundred times and I've written it in magazines and I've, uh, you know, I probably say it on the boat two or three times a week when I was probably about, probably about 12 or 13 years old, probably that sixth, seventh grade. We always had a copy of Florida Sportsman magazine in my house. And I always loved, uh, I always loved kind of the short, the short uh, articles in the front and the back of the magazine. I could never read those big long ones. I just get lost, you know. In the, at that age, I'd get lost. So one that really stuck with me was this little two paragraph article in the front, and it was called "Every Cast, Every Time." And the author was talking about how fishing is, whether it's with your boat or or your, or your lure is all about covering water. How much water can you cover in a day? You know, and he talked about casting and he said, you know, when you think about casting and you're, you're fishing open water, like we do as inshore fishermen, uh, your, your casting distance can, can really make, make your day go a lot, a lot farther. If you, and he made like a short example and he said, you know, if you think about going fishing and you make 500 casts in a day, Captain Bobby and I talked about this the other day. I don't think you can make 500 casts in a day. That's a lot of, that's a lot of casts, but, uh, I've never <laughs> counted, but I've, yeah, no, I know. That's what I asked. That's why I asked Bobby. We kind of just did some short math, you know, on a, on an eight hour day, you know what I mean? And we came up with about 400. So, uh, so anyway, you just say 400, but I always like to say 500 because of this, but, uh, so 500 cast, if I throw it 10 feet farther than you, Angelo, all day, 
and you equate that, you know, do some quick math, 500 cast times 10 feet, that's 5,000 feet. And that's a mile. That's almost a mile Agreed. of water that I covered more than you, you know? So if you've knocked it down to 400, that's three quarters of a mile. You know what I mean? Still a bunch. Yeah. It adds yeah, up. And, 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 and think about that standing right next to somebody, you covered a mile more water. You know what I mean? Now that, if that that's don't make bunch. you want to cast farther, I don't know what does because that's so, you yeah. know, yeah. And, It'd be a lot uh, more fish. Um, yeah. Sorry to get... your equation. Say it again. I cast more than you. Cause I don't have to work it as far, far though. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, sorry to get us <laughs> off on that tangent. But, well, uh, you know, but the way you're thinking about it to me is still correct, right? Like if I cast twice in the same spot, does it count for anything? I, I you know, there's diminishing returns at some point. Got to right. be. Yeah, man. If you guys are uh, nerding out about the about the rod builds and the specific kind of builds, I've really been enjoying that mastering rod building that Bill does over at the Anglers Resource Podcast. That's a great podcast. You guys check out the mastering rod building. Well, man, let's get into the report, Cap. Uh, kind of where you've been and, and and what's been going on around here. Well, um, it's still definitely a uh, – where uh, for speckled trout and the redfish bite and stuff, it's all been really good still in the tidal rivers, tidal systems in and around Mobile Bay. Um, the uh, – we've been talking about the slick lure already. That's been a, that's been a dynamite, a dynamite lure to be throwing lately. Um, we also been doing some good on some grubs as well. Uh, doing some jigging um, in your deeper stretches, like with this cold weather that we've got right now. Um, you know, when you're seeing lows in the, in the twenties and thirties, you're going to want to focus on those areas in the, in the, in the tidal rivers that are going to be deeper. And a lot of times, man, it's going to shock them. It's going to shock these fish and they're going to get their natural naturally they're going to fall into your to your uh to your deeper holes that are relative to to the to the river you know like uh but you live on foul river so i ain't no fish in here <laughs> well you know if you think about foul river like mo the, probably the average depth throughout foul river is like six to nine foot of water you know but there are sure. like some 18 and 20 foot holes uh 16 to 20 foot holes i guess we'll say those are going to be in one of the areas you're going to want to be around anyway, you know, that they're going to relate more to that. And then, you know, the, uh, and a lot of times they get down on that bottom and, and they hug that bottom and they, the, the bite is real subtle sometimes around these times. So a jig going to a jig works really well. Uh, that I really, really, really like the, uh, the uh, slick, the, the little slick, uh is good is good on that um and then uh, another another just kind of old tried and true is that baby bass uh zoom fluke um they make like three different sizes like a uh a, a giant size a medium size and, a, and then kind of a little like three three and a half inch one that middle one let's we'll say it's probably a four four and a half inch i don't have a pack of them right here i could i could rattle it off but you can find them fairly easily you know zoom's a big company um for sure that, yeah like i said that baby bass color is great in all 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 systems all types of water colors uh dirty clear um you know brown or green i don't know what it is about that color but it's really really good and uh are you rigging fish... are you rigging that little slick or the excuse me the slick junior on a jig head or are you doing it swim bait style J or how jig head. De jig definitely head. a jig head um when you start targeting these deeper areas, like you're going to need to be uh, uh, coming up here, you're going to want to use at least a quarter ounce, if not a three eighths. Once I start to get above, uh, once I start to get deeper than about 14 feet, I have to go to a three eighths really to get to, to, to main contact with the bottom. And that's what I always tell folks when they jump on the boat with me and I'm trying to coach somebody up uh, on a jig jigging is you got to make sure that that jig's hitting the bottom. And I watch my line a lot to do that, or I Me can kind of just, I can feel it. I could do it. I could do it with blindfolded now, but um, you, you really got to watch that line and, uh, and make sure that, that, that you'll, you, you'll kind of see your line see go slack. And, mm -hmm. Yep. And, um, and so main, maintaining contact is, is very, very important when you're jig fishing in the, in the winter time. Man, talking about fishing these deep holes and these, uh, you know, tidal rivers and tributaries, are you just like, oh, it's twenty feet here? Let's let's make a few casts. Or are you kind of scanning and and making sure there's fish there, or how are you locating these fish, Cap? Yep, uh, 
Uh, yep, definitely using your bottom machine uh, this time of year, uh, and especially when you're getting in those deeper stretches like that, you need to um, you need to pay attention to your bottom machine, and that'll also kind of tell you where the fish are. You know what I mean? Like if if you get in some of those deeper holes, and you're seeing like some big, uh, I call them arches. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Uh, on your bottom machine, um, you need to pay attention to where those are in relative to the water. You know, in the water column. Sometimes they're they're six or seven feet up off the bottom, and then sometimes they are right on the bottom. Look like they're piled up like cordwood. <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah, it's that's what's kind of fun about this time of year is you will find them piled up all in one spot. You know, and uh, they they get hungry, and you throw a real easy presentation down there to them. It can make for some some really good fishing. It can also make for some very tough slush trading. Yeah, you know, but yeah. Man, the, more and more every year, uh, year after year, I just feel like I love the wintertime fishing more and more and more and more. And I, I used to, I remember being a kid dreading, dreading January and February coming around. That was just like, <laughs> that was a very depressive time of year, you know, for me. Yeah. And I just can't get enough. My favorite part about winter fishing is you're not sweating. Mm-hmm. It's been nice. My favorite now. part is not sweating and uh, man, you're uh you getting a chunk artificial bait all day. There's for no sure. need for live bait. Now, you know, we, we're kind of talking about speckled trout fishing, uh with and and I just said something about live bait. Uh live bait can come in really, really, really handy this time of year. Um a couple of times butch up there by your house on some charters not too long ago. Uh, I was freelining some shrimp around some uh some points and pretty much there was like one little section of the river uh where any of the little points you got on over there you're free line and a shrimp man you were catching a um a redfish or a uh, puppy drum or a sheep's head um yeah. it was it was dynamite it was every it was every dead gum cast just about every time a shrimp went in the water you're gonna bite on something um and uh i think a lot of those fish were relating to they're relating to the points the points uh, but they're also relating to the woods and stumps and everything that's Whole down structure. there. Yeah. Yeah. We were getting hung up quite a bit and, uh, which just comes with the territory. Um, sure. but, uh, but man, that made for some great action. Um, that made for some really, really good action. Yep. That's definitely fun, man. I was, uh, riding around. I think that was Sunday that we had a pretty nice day kind of riding around with Lillian chilling out and, uh, doing some scanning kind of trying to figure out my electronics a little bit, which I lack on for sure. Um, and I was kind of, you know, locating some, what I for sure knew were bait balls and then, you know, going kind of through those deep pockets and you're seeing the individual fish. Um, I mean, is that what you're looking for? Typically, can you pick them out oh, you yeah. know, as far as bait ball? Like, all right, there's individual marks. Those have got to be trout or some sort of fish that we want to catch. I would think. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you'll see the individual fish and the, the big, the big uh, giveaway to me a lot of times, especially with that, um, when you're side scanning, uh, is you'll see the shadows of the fish behind it. Right. Um, uh, okay. That's a great tip. Yeah. Yeah. When you start to see those shadows behind, you know, that's a better, d bigger, denser size fish. Uh, when you start to see those shadows and then on your traditional side too, I always am looking at that traditional sonar as well. Yeah. I and usually like run I double. I'll use side scan on this side and then sonar on this side. Right. And then, and you, but when you start to see like mullet and little things, they're going to look like little straight lines that'll be piled up on top of each other. And then you can even tell the difference too with pogies because they'll look more like a cloud, but That's you can right. see all those indi individual little fish inside. And then trout are not going to be densely schooled together, but you're going to, you're going to see an arch like a, um, like a mcdonald's arch you know but only one of them <laughs> only one of them uh you'll you'll see these two little tails come off of the of that hard return right there in the middle of the water column and that's that's uh that's that's nine times out of ten that speckled trout and don't ask me why those trout mark up like that in the mullet that are <laughs> sometimes the same size do not but that's what a speckled trout on the machine generally looks like as an arch definitely makes sense great tip yep um but anywho the uh i look for uh you know uh we kind of also before we uh got on we were we were kind of figuring out what we want to talk about and uh, i made a note about the delta um looks like it's we got we definitely got some fresh water coming down from that uh weather system we had last week so uh i just 
looked at bearish steam plant. It's around seven and a half feet right now. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's crested and it's falling very slowly. Um, that's, uh, and the, which is not asked, that alarming, right? That's correct. Yeah. You kind of asked me what my alarms were. Um, seven or eight feet usually gives like the Delta and I, I don't, you know, the Delta, there has been still some fish in the Delta, but that usually will probably take care of the Delta. Um, it'll give it a good little flush. Now we've had an immense amount of salt around, sure. so it might not completely kill it. Um, but we'll see. Um, uh, everything, uh, in the Delta in the lower Delta usually starts to clean up once you see that uh berry steam plants start to go tidal again you know or you'll see a rise and fall in the tide each day with it and that's generally when you'll start to see it clean up um now see, a lot of know, times to go ahead just making sure i'm understanding you correctly you know you look at the tide charts and you have the normal you know low uh you have the normal low tide high tide low tide high tide this day low tide high tide and then whenever there's a, there's a big crest it kind of just you get that preliminary mark that keeps going up and up and up and up. And that's what alarms you. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. When you start to see the line, like you'll see like a, uh, an actual line that where the water's at. And when it starts to get real flat looking, that's when it's, that's when it's on the rise or there's a lot of water coming down and then you'll start to see it start bumping even again out again. Yeah. It'll even out. And then, like I said, it'll start bumping just up a little bit down a little bit. And that's when you're, the, it's starting to, the gauge is starting to fill the tide again, you know, and once it gets gotcha. around six, seven feet, something like that is when you'll start to see it bumping again. Um, and that's when things will clean up. And what I was going to say is a lot of times that doesn't always hurt things, uh, especially like in that Mobile River when we're talking about this deep water jigging stuff. Um, some fresh water coming down to, does not hurt things. And what that does is it, it, it it uh it will bunch the fish up in areas um where they're kind of spread out can go wherever they want when it's nice and salty uh in a regular time uh when you get that fresh water it condenses them into 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 areas so uh and salt water is much denser than fresh so a lot of times that fresh skims right across the top and there's still good salt water down deep on the bottom I mean, dude, all the questions I'm going to ask, you answer them before I can even ask them. I was curious about the density of salt water and uh, how that was affected in something like the Mobile River system. Yeah, I would yep, assume in those deeper pockets, those what we call stable water holes are going to are going to maintain their stability as far as salinity and a little bit warmer. So those fish are going to keep there and, and bunch up there. That's correct. What are the fish eating this time of year? I mean, it just it, there doesn't seem to be a lot of bait around. Yeah, they're um they're and that's 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 a good that's a good question, um, Angelo, because to me that's what makes some wintertime fishing really fun because after when you get these cold these cold snaps like in the I kind of think about it more happening like in December I guess I guess we're in January January time frame. When you get these lows, it kind of flushes a lot of the bait out of there. The fish need to stay there to live, you know, because like uh, Butch was just hitting on, you got that deeper, more stable water. And uh, in, in some of these areas, like in, especially like the Mobile River that we're talking about. Um, and so anyway, when all that bait gets out of there, you could throw it. I wouldn't say you could throw anything at them, but anything that they see down there, they've got to hit it and eat to, to eat and feed and stay alive. Um, but I, I would, um, I don't really keep a whole lot of fish this time of year, but, uh, you know, you'll find pogies and some, uh, some small mullet and things. So I, I would think that they would, they would scrounge and forage on anything. If they found some kind of like worms living down in the mud, uh, the other day when we caught some fish during our tournament on Saturday, a lot of them's bellies were kind of red, like they been like, lay, yeah, like they were laying down in that mud a little bit, um, so uh, I, I would think they're very opportunistic this time of year. Yeah, not very picky. Um, have you noticed that there is a you know a better bite on a on a high tide or a low tide, or are you just looking for moving water right now? Uh, that's kind of to me. That's kind of relative. Uh, I mean, that's just relative to where you're going to be fishing. Um, and everybody kind of has a different story about it. You know what I mean? To be honest with you. Um, you know, like when I'm in the Delta, I really like a falling tide, like high in the morning and falling. But there again, 
that whole system to me is a deep water system. So you've got plenty of water up there. Like Dog River uh, is a really shallow system, in my opinion. For sure. So, uh, so on your low, low tide, low tide, um, uh, condition, it does not fish near as well as, as a, as a, as a more full tide. Uh, got a lot less, got, you have a lot less water to work with. That's correct. Yep. And, um, and then like foul river is a, is a deeper, much deeper system. Average depth is much deeper in foul river. So it doesn't affect them quite as bad in foul, uh, as it does a place like dog. Um, but yeah, moving water and it, it really, it really just, the uh, that's kind of what's neat about foul river. I mean, dog river sometimes is when, even when you don't have a lot of moving water, as long as it's high, higher in that system, it works. Um, like for, for me, it does. So those are the kind of things you need to take note of, um, yeah. when, when you're fishing some of these systems, um, winter time's known for for the water being low for sure <laughs> you know it's been crazy uh, low in here on mornings too yeah yesterday we had a negative one um with yeah. all that wind with all yeah. that wind coming out yeah. of the north after that little front yeah um we are what it's probably like a a quarter or so on the new moon it's kind of working its way up have you noticed that making any impact uh no not really um not really uh i tell you something that, uh that kind of blew blew uh cap bobby and i's mind the other day in um in our tournament that we were fishing we started out we kind of had a little bit of a bite first thing in the morning and uh we were real patient stayed in the same area all day and uh just kept grinding grinding we had about a four hour period we probably didn't get a bite for four hours and right. We had a so lunar major that was from one to like one twenty to three twenty, and I think about twelve forty five we kind of started to get some little fish bites, and it just kind of got better and better and better. And then we uh, we ended up putting putting two more good fish on our stringer like in the middle of the day, um, right that right as we started to approach that major, um, and that was that was really cool. We we literally. Uh, there was another boat where we wanted to be and they fished through an area and we, and they left and we, we we're kind of, we were right on, right at the start of that major. And we pulled in right behind them and caught two, two more, two more fish that were, that went on our stringer that day. Nice. And, uh, and it was just, it was just absolutely blew your mind. Um, I don't, and always my, you know, people always ask me, Hey, do you pay attention to that? Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, I definitely pay attention to it. But I don't live my life by it. I'm not going to plan your whole you know day I mean? around it. No, well, you know, people book me to go, man. I'm like just a regular guy, you know. I've got I've got kids and and uh, and chores and things to do, you know. So uh, a life to live. So I get up and go to work every morning, and right. Uh, I, I I don't always have the luxury of saying, "Oh yeah, well that uh, that's the lunar majors from one one thirty to uh, to three thirty tomorrow." So uh, we're gonna go in the afternoon. You know, I can't, right. I, can't I can't do that, but it uh. Golly, it sure it sure makes there's more something and more to sense. it man there's no it doubt makes, about it it makes more and more sense uh the more and more i pay attention to it yeah me too and i've del i've definitely been paying more and more attention to it uh deer hunting as well man you can almost set your timer on it it's pretty pretty cool yeah i was uh listening to chris bush's podcast the speckled truth uh i mean a couple of years ago and he had his dad on there um i guess maybe it was the first episode i believe his I mean, it was his dad was said this you know he's like man He's like, there's something to, I'm telling you, there's something to the salooner thing, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, next time you're uh, you're driving down the road, you know, down the interstate and you see deer in a Look field at the or, major. You see a rac- yep. or you you see a raccoon crossing the road or something like that in the middle of the day. He said, check that joker. And he said, yep. sure enough, it'll always be, you know, either a minor or a major, you know, uh, on it, man. Yep. And sure enough, I started doing it, man. It was like, yep, yep he's on the song. <laughs> yep, I definitely agree with that. I mean, it isn't. A direct science but i mean like if you're looking for some hope and you ain't had any bites you know we were talking about it earlier with adam like how do you stay in a good headspace i mean it's one thing watching a rod tip for four hours it's another thing casting one of these seven foot six cold-blooded sticks for over four and over hours. sure i mean like you can't even whip out the grill and cook a cook a hot dog <laughs> you're right 
We uh, but, we have like, we have pork chops on the boat there, uh, Angela. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was triple tail fishing with a guy, and he goes, "Hey, I brought some uh, lamb chops." I mean, <laughs> lamb chops are the worst thing to try to bring on a triple tail trip because you're having to like run and gun. I'm like, dude, how are we gonna how are we gonna cook these lamb chops? And we had to we forgot the propane, so we had to swing into Dolphin <laughs> Island all the way over from here. Hey, you gotta oh, eat, man. That's funny. Uh, all right, Cap, that's been a great report, man. If you if you had to impart some wisdom on our listeners this weekend kind of going into the end of the weekend what's what's going to be your tip uh so a couple of things uh i really i wanted first of all i want to hit on that uh what we just got done talking about which is those the salooner uh major and minors uh when you go fishing um it, at least look at it the day before you're going uh you know uh like angelo just got done talking about it being just bone chilling cold uh, right now. So getting up early first thing in the morning, going freezing to death, you know, uh, for a couple hours in the morning may or may not. If you don't have to, but (laughs) that's right. But at least try to work that, that one of those periods in um, to your day, if you can, you know what I mean? Sometimes they're like late in the afternoon from like four 30 to six 30, you know, Um, or, 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 or they're going to be like, you know, pre-sunrise or something like middle that. of the night so, sometimes sure correct correct you're always going to have two two majors in a day you're going to and, and that's uh when you got moon above head and then opposing opposing moon when it's on the other side of the earth um and so that's when your majors are your minors are going to be moon rise and moon set so you basically got four periods per 24 hours you know that you're going to get it and uh I think it's definitely this time of year going to give you the best uh, best opportunity to do something, uh, generally speaking, around one of those cylinder periods. Uh, the other thing that kind of poked out to me in my report, too, uh, working around this really, really cold weather we've got, um, and that's uh, that's paying attention to your electronics and then and then being patient when you do find something like, you know, around around those uh, around those deeper sections of wherever you're fishing. What do you mean by being patient? You mean making more casts or do you mean making throwing casts, different lures or? Yeah. I mean, but just sometimes the bite is so subtle and they are so, uh, I think it's, it's almost hard for them to pop their mouth open yeah. and inhale So lethargic water. and dormant ish. They, they are, they are very lethargic. That is a very perfect way to put it. So, uh, you need to, you got to slow down, Sure. slow, slow your retrieve down, make sure you're hitting contacting that bottom and you feel anything on that rod tip set the hook you know it's like captain bobby always says man hook sets are free you know that's I mean? right you never know when it's going to be a fish and you'll tell when they're lethargic like that too man you'll you'll fight the fish and they just kind of wiggle their head back and forth the whole way back to the boat you know they won't yep. even they won't they won't be digging down and trying to burn jumping and stuff off. yeah right. <laughs> they just gotta they just gotta like wag their head back and forth and yep. <laughs> too tired right to the- fight so they're like humans in the winter. That's oh, right. yeah. Too cold to fight. Yeah. Uh, they need they knees hurt too. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's an awesome report and a great tip, man. We always appreciate you being on and sharing your wisdom with our listeners. If people want to get up with you and book a trip, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Yep, you can catch me on the social medias, and that's at Cold Blooded Fishing, or check out my website, coldbloodedfishing.com, or hit me on the uh, telephone uh text call it call me or text me 251-459-5077 thank you yep man i appreciate it and uh summer's gonna be here spring's gonna be here for you know it's almost wade fishing time i can't believe it i mean it'll be here for i you know, know i know yeah anybody who's thinking about booking a yep. trip needs to do it uh last week i counted up i booked 38 trips last week so uh i'm start thinking about those uh, oh, springtime yeah. and summertime trips absolutely that's, that's it man i'm looking forward to it Yep, always, man. Well, as we said, man, appreciate it. Looking forward to next time, Cap. It's always good to hear from Captain Richard Rutland on the Inshore Report. You guys take a quick break and check out this week's Inshore Report sponsor. That segment was brought to you by Mallard Bay. 
All right, Angelo, you know it would not be an Alabama saltwater fishing report if we did not do what did you learn, man? A lot of good information today. I enjoyed Chris's report. I enjoy hearing new people, new people's perspectives. Like he did really well. That was fun. Yeah, what did no, you, uh, good, good reports today. Yeah, what would you pick up from today's reports? Anything stick out to you? I mean, you know, sometimes it helps when somebody just says, yeah, me too, right? Like if you For have sure. a hunt, uh, like can confirm some things that you may be thinking. It's kind of like why you would pay a consultant, um, which this show is like the consulting of saltwater fishing right. in our area. Right. Uh, you know, I guess we had like, I had some stuff I learned and I had some stuff me too, like that the the solar chart in the major miners, like, you know, we ask that and we talk about it a lot, but like, I feel like the more we talk about it, the more it kind of confirms a lot of it. It's Absolutely not agree with that. As as like Adam experienced today, right? Yep. Uh, but, uh, you know, and then like as it plays into headspace to whether it's, you know, especially as it relates to fishing, like how do you stay engaged or like excited when the bite's slow? Well, like you sometimes it's just like you're working towards something that you feel is going to be good in the future and it, you know hey look in three hours it's going to be a good bite maybe we don't rush out and freeze our butts off this morning or hey you know what you're you're getting hungry maybe it's a good time to put the get the grill up you know some good hot food especially while you're offshore uh can get the morale up a little you know yep. so i think on that front and uh you know, Richard's rods. I mean, that was like what I learned. Yeah. Uh, you know, like three inches gives you 20 feet. I mean, is there like a math equation? Um, I'm sure there is. MC squared. I'm sure there like is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not so good with the math and, and the numbers, but yeah, I'm sure there's something like that. Yeah. I mean, so that was interesting. And then, like, when he put it into the terms of like, hey, you know, if it's 400 cash, you're covering an extra three quarters of a mile in a day of fishing. You know, I think that yeah, there's some there's definitely some things to covering water. I think I think about that when we're trolling. Uh, I also think, though, like what's the multiplier in that extra 20 feet that like your boat's not spooking the fish? For sure. A right? bunch of that. Oh, yeah. Getting away away from that displacement, the noise, et cetera. Yeah. So, I mean, that was, that was, that was some good information there. Like I've never not learned anything when I do one of these shows. Yep. I agree. I definitely like the rod talk. Um, you know, Captain Richard obviously builds his own rods like he's talking about and he can, he, he has learned enough to where he can build a rod that makes him less fatigued, can cast further. Um, yeah, just all things to pay attention to. And like you're saying, don't sleep on the majors and minors, man. If, you know, if that's like you're saying, something to look forward to to keep that positive mental attitude. If that's the way you need to look at it, great. But um, if not, you know, some of us have the luxury of, you know, if it's Saturday and we're going fishing today or Sunday or or wherever, whatever day you get to go fishing, um, definitely during that major and or minor, if you can't get the major, make sure that you are in a spot um, that is holding fish that you see fish on the on the fish finder you're like all right let's just wait for these things to turn on you know kind of optimize your time on the water which we talk about a, a decent yeah, amount make, as well make sure you're located and right now make sure you're located in some deep water yep. like you know those two things can like that thought process can make or break whether you're uh you're you're catching or you're fishing right yep. well like Captain like, richard was saying to him and bobby you know they 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 uh weren't really planning on it, but that major hit him at, you know, whatever he said, one or two or three o'clock, which is not whenever you'd think an optimal time for a great bite was, but they were able to add to their bag during that major in a, you know, undesirable time, if, you know, for lack of better words. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is, is just like, man, thinking about making 400 casts in a day, <laughs> like, you know, if you're just not used to it, like, especially the fatigue thing, like, right? Oh, it'll like, wear you out. Important to you? Like, you got to give something, nothing's ever going to be perfect. So, like, is it more important to be able to fish and not get that extra 20 feet? But you're like, you're not going to see the orthopedic surgeon next week, right? 
So yeah. I think it's like you look at you, you look at your health situation, you know, and, and, and kind of what you're wanting to put up with as far as like, do you need some Tylenol or not whenever you get fishing? I mean, that is, right. and I just think about throwing poppers all day. I mean, dude, it is it'll wear so you out. Oh, it'll wear yes. you out, man. Yeah, for sure. Even if you're not using the, you know, the, the nice, uh, light rods. I've, I know I've said it several times on here, uh, before I kind of got into the, you know, the, the inshore game and figuring out, you know, what rod was best for what and how much difference it makes to have nice stuff. Um, it'll wear you out if you're working a, you know, a slick lure or an artificial bait or even a popping cork with a, you know, a big old bulky heavy rod it absolutely makes a difference. And I learned that the hard way. Dude, I like, I'm just a proponent of nice things, right? Like I think if you're going to go enjoy the experience, like why go do it? If you're going to be with mediocre equipment, no doubt. Like, but if you don't nice, know, you don't know. You don't know what you don't know, too. You know. Yeah, nice equipment just to me enhances the experience. To make your experience way better. Totally agree with that. So, I think that's what you get with real estate with me. Selfless plug, but you know that's right. When you do, hey. when you do a deal with me, it is like working with the best equipment out there. That's like, right. Best team whole team at your expenditure yep yep so anyways i won't go any deeper into that that's my thoughts though that's how my brain works is i'm a believer in, in having the best best possible outcomes by employing the best tactics and the best equipment all right guys that wraps up another great what did you learn let's take a quick break and check out this week's what you learn sponsor that segment was brought to you by bucks island All right, Angelo, as you kind of alluded to there, man, I know you guys do an awesome operation over there. Pretty much anything, anything to do with real estate from what Panama City over to Dolphin Island, you guys specialize in. Um, we appreciate you being on the show. Certainly appreciate you being a sponsor and bringing the people the fishing report for free each week, man. If people want to, if they're in the market and or will be in the market or have their finger on that pulse, you know, what's the best way to get in contact with you? I mean, dude, just go look me up. Google my name, Angelo Di Paola. Google the Coastal Connection Real Estate, and you'll end up on my website. That way, you don't have to remember a phone number. Give us a call, like especially that phone number on my website. That's like a essentially a twenty four seven line. Somebody's somebody's got that forwarded to their phone. If they don't answer, uh, they'll they'll call you back, and we'll we'll get we'll be back with you promptly and quickly. And I, you know, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Like, like I just appreciate this show. I know I say it every year and, and every show, but it is, it, this show has been such a blessing in my life. Uh, not just on the business front, but like just getting to know you and Joe and like, I mean, I grew up knowing really more your brother than you for sure, but you know, just kind of developing that friendship over the past couple of years and getting to do some fishing together. It's just been awesome. Been awesome. I totally agree, man. Um, enjoyed it today, man. Thanks for being in the studio with me. I always enjoy your wisdom and your questions. You always have and great sandwiches. You always make some great food references, which I enjoy <laughs> as well. <laughs> well, man, appreciate it. Y'all have a good one. Catch you next time. Excited about 2024, man. Looking forward to it. Oh, yeah.